BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And welcome to BBOR, the home of True Crime Talk Radio and your premier destination for unsolved mysteries, criminal psychology, and exploring the dark side of cyberspace. My name is Ned DeHaan, and I am your host as well as the creator of Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube, and regular contributor to the Zodiac Killer channel. And a great way to support these shows is just by listening to some more content. But you can also go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse, written by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel, murder mystery, inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to check out some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Let the show begin. Okay, hello everybody. Today is Wednesday, and on Wednesdays this year I've been doing a regular segment about Jack the Ripper... And multiple people requested an episode about the Jack the Ripper suspect, Francis Thompson. And this is primarily in response to an episode that came out on the Jack the Ripper Tour YouTube channel. But this is hardly a new find. Francis Thompson has been a suspect going back at least until the 1980s and before that. But the person who was presenting on the Jack the Ripper Tour channel was named Richard Patterson, who is the author of the book on the subject. And was presenting his case about why he thought that Francis Thompson was Jack the Ripper. Now, I'm trying to get to more of your requested topics, so if you have a suspect that you would like covered for this Jack the Ripper series, or if there's something else that you're curious about for Ripper Wednesday, you can put your idea in the comment section down below. I also do the Anything Goes Friday segment, where any subject is fair game. So please feel free to suggest things for future episodes. And you can also hit the like button, subscribe, and a great way to support all of these efforts is to go over to buymeacoffee.com. Buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxnit88 allows you to make a donation or contribution to help support the show, and anybody who makes a donation will get a shout-out on Zodiac Monday. Francis Thompson is a suspect that is somewhat discussed in Jack the Ripper circles. As I said, he has been mentioned for decades, and Richard Patterson himself has been talking about him for decades. But also, there was a point that was made on the Jack the Ripper Tour YouTube channel, and that is that certain other suspects more mainstream, and they're discussed more frequently. Some of these would be James Maybrick, that was the first one that they mentioned, and also perhaps somebody such as Montague John Druitt, and last week on the channel I was talking about a different Francis, Francis Tumblety. And if I can be very blunt with you guys, just in case someone hasn't heard the previous Ripper Wednesday episodes, I think that James Maybrick and Francis Tumblety are rather weak suspects. James Maybrick comes into play because a guy named Michael Barrett claims that he found a diary from some... Well, he obtained a diary from somebody with this confession from James Maybrick stating that James Maybrick was Jack the Ripper, but almost certainly it was a forgery. And that's not the only reason, because Richard Patterson asked him, asked the audience a challenge question about why. Why do these other suspects get discussed more frequently? It's not only that some guy came forward and said he found a diary from someone claiming to be Jack the Ripper. If I were to go forward and say, hey, I have this diary from Johnny Boy Smith, and he says that he's the Zodiac Killer, I mean, is that going to make this you know, made-up suspect Johnny Boy Smith widely discussed? No. It's because the media took the story and ran with it, and there was this high-profile um, documentary called The Diary of Jack the Ripper w was made about James Maybrick as a Ripper suspect, and that was um, even shared on YouTube. You can watch that here on YouTube for free. And other suspects like Montague John Druitt are... Um, They've been discussed all the way back to the 1800s, so there are reasons. I just think that they're rather weak, and it's all based on this idea of how somebody was just going insane and going into a descent into madness, and then some way, somehow, he was able to compose himself together in his daily life, and then he committed suicide three weeks after the final crime, yet nobody would have truly suspected anything. I mean, it doesn't quite add up, or it appears on the surface that it makes sense, but when you actually listen to the theory that has been put forward, then it all starts to fall apart. And with Francis Thompson, the person who's the subject of today's episode, 
I actually think that Richard Patterson, as well as the people who support this particular theory, have done a rather strong job of putting the pieces together. I'm not endorsing this theory because this is an unsolved case, and I'm still relatively uncertain about the identity of Jack the Ripper. But I can comprehend how all of these things are being put in order. Firstly, Francis Thompson was born in 1859, so he would have been in his late 20s at, in 1888 at the time of the Whitechapel murders. Jack the Ripper was a serial killer who operated from August 31st to November 9th of 1888, committing a crime spree that would leave five women dead. Some people believe that the Whitechapel murders began months earlier, some people be believe they began weeks earlier, and some people think that they went on for years after after the murder of Mary Kelly, the final victim. But what stands out with Francis Thompson as a Jack the Ripper suspect is that, number one, he was well-educated. Number two, he was relatively unstable with his choices in life. He wanted to become a priest, and for about eight years of his life, according to Patterson, he was planning on becoming a priest from the age of 10 all the way to the age of 18, but he had a falling out with somebody in the priesthood, and there aren't a lot of details that are shared as to why, so that fell apart. Then he tries to become a doctor, goes through six years of medical school, and that also doesn't appear to work out for him. It seems like he's living the life of a gifted underachiever and an underperformer. And one point that was made very clear, though, on, um, in the interviews that Patterson does, he has multiple interviews here on YouTube, he, and he has shared his um, observation that that Francis Thompson didn't necessarily want to succeed at these pathways, and in some ways he was even self-sabotaging in particular ways. He definitely cared about one thing, though, and that was his writing. Because in, aside from being a failed priest and a failed doctor, he was a poet, he was an author, and he went on to become most famous for his poetry. And his uh, poetry is available at mypoeticside.com, and I would like to read one. This is not his most famous poem, but it's called An Arab Love Song. I it's Just the first one that caught my attention with the letter A at the top of the list, and I will share some of them with you guys here. The hunched camels of the night trouble the bright and silver waters of the moon, and the maidens of morn will soon, through heaven stray and sing, star gathering. Now while the dark about our lovers is strewn, light of my dark, blood o' oh my heart, O oh come, and night will catch her breath up and be dumb. Yeah, this guy's definitely Jack the Ripper. Take back what I said before. Definitely him. No, I don't, I don't genuinely mean that, but you can see how that's a type of undertone already, already shared. But as I said, there are multiple places on YouTube where you can hear Richard Patterson sharing his observations about the Jack the Ripper mystery. He also appeared on the Unlocking the Code podcast and on the YouTube channel Demon House. Demon House features actually a very well-done documentary. The Demon House presentation is very well done, but, I mean, it's very well done in terms of the packaging and the editing. However, I do confess it turned into a little bit of unintentional ASMR, but I particularly liked the Unlocking the Code podcast interview. First time I've heard anything from that channel, and the host is um, being very inquisitive, and he's um, asking some challenge questions, but at the same time being mostly respectful. But let's look at some of the points. Okay, so Francis Thompson is a gifted underachiever. He has medical knowledge, and he is someone who didn't actually become a doctor. But one thing that Patterson also wants to share is that he had a lot of medical knowledge, but it was primarily surgical and anatomical, like he understands the components of the human body, but he would not have been able to be on the same level intellectually with someone who had graduated medical school. His primary form of education was in surgery. So that's another point that is in favor of him being the Ripper, because the victims in the Ripper case weren't only murdered, they were also mutilated. And what, according to um, these stories that have been shared about Thompson, is that he would have carried a rather large scalpel with him. Sometimes it's even referred to as a knife in his coat pocket, and he also kept a copy of the only short story that he had, he had written, as well as a copy of one of his poems. So... It's like not exactly a grand conspiracy or not exactly anything that is out of the ordinary. It's somebody who was a little bit out of his mind and he knew a thing or two about the human body and that's the Jack the Ripper theory. And one more time, the book that is available is called Jack the Ripper, The Works of Francis Thompson by Richard Patterson. 
And another point, though, that is shared in favor of his guild being Jack the Ripper is that he got a job working in a factory that made medical instruments, and his job was actually to do, I guess, what we would call quality control inspecting. He's not making the medical instruments like scalpels and such. He simply would be inspecting them on a conveyor belt, and this may have been some type of mind-numbing job that would have bothered him in a particular way, but or just something that isn't truly using his intellectual faculties. Also, Francis Thompson then battles with something which is drug addiction, or just being particularly addicted to um, opiates. Wait, excuse me if I said opiates. I was thinking more of the modern-day opiate crisis. Opium. He would have been addicted to opium. And the more I read about the Jack the Ripper case, the more I believe that almost certainly the Ripper would have either been heavily addicted to drugs to do what he did to those women's bodies, those types of mutilations, or he was someone who was very, very sadistic. I mean, someone who was just psychopathic and sadistic, wanted to inflict pain on to, into the people, as well as someone who also wanted to mutilate the bodies post-mortem to show disrespect. Now, another point the reason why people would think that Francis Thompson is Jack the Ripper is that he developed a relationship with a prostitute and then had a falling out with that woman, and that this could have fueled a type of rage and animosity toward women. And when I was watching the interview on on Demon House, which is actually a documentary presentation, I mean, Roger Patterson, Roger Patterson, he was the guy who um, made the Patterson-Gimlin film in 1966, excuse me. One thing that matches up with the FBI profile created by John Douglas is that this is someone who was in their late 20s, possibly early 30s, as well as someone who was most likely a lifelong resident of Whitechapel or in the city of London, which would eliminate a lot of suspects who were born in, say, perhaps Poland or maybe even Russia. I mean, those suspects do get taught, discussed very frequently, most notably Aaron Kosminski. But with somebody such as Francis Thompson, a lot of these elements come together. And I would like to read one of his uh, poems right here. And as I said, yes, not many of them have been posted onto the um, website, My Poetic Side, because this one is a little bit more relevant to the Jack the Ripper case. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind and in the midst of tears. I hid from him, and under running laughter, up visited hopes I sped, and shots precipitated, adown titanic glooms of chasm fears, from those strong feet that followed after. But with unhurrying chase and unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy, they beat, a voice beat, more instant, then the feet, all things betray thee, who betrayest me. I pleaded outlaw wise by many a hearted casement, curtained red, trellised with intertwining charities. For though I knew his love who followed, yet was I sore adread, lest having him I must have not beside. But if a one little casement parted wide, the gust of his approach would clash it too. Fear wist not to evade, as love wist to pursue. Across the margin of the world I fled, and troubled the gold gateways of stars, smiting for shelter on their clanged bars, fretted to dulcet jars, and silvern chatter the pale ports of moon. I said to dawn, be sudden, to Eve be soon, with thy young skay blossoms heap over me, from this tremendous lover, float thy vague veil about me, 
lest he see. I tempted all his servitors, but to find my own betrayal in their constancy, in faith to him their fickleness to me, their traitorous trueness and their loyal deceit. To all swift things for swiftness did I sue, clung to the whistling mane of every wind. But whether they swept smoothly fleet, their long savannas of the blue, or whether thunder driven, they clanged his chariot thwart a heaven, plashy with flying lightnings around their spurn feet. Fear wist not to evade as love wished to pursue, still with unhurrying chase, an unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy, came on the following feet, and a voice above their beat, not shelters thee. Who wilt not shelter me? I sought no more after which I strayed in face of man or maid. I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit here. The breasts owe her tenderness. Never did any milk of hers once bless my thirsting mouth. Nigh and nigh draws the chase with unperturbed pace. And that is just an excerpt from his poem, The Hound of Heaven, which is referred to as his most famous poem. And even on his own Wikipedia page, it says that the playwright Eugene O'Neill could recite it from memory. And this is another thing that happens with the story of Francis Thompson. He becomes very influential on other people. Some other things that were shared were that Gandhi, like Mahatma Gandhi, was a big fan of his poetry, particularly when uh, Gandhi was uh, living by himself. He wanted to keep the poetry of Francis Thompson close by. And when I was listening to that podcast, Unlocking the Code, it started out as a very good Jack the Ripper discussion, and then it evolved into a bunch of wild stories about how Francis Thompson is responsible for the sinking of the Titanic, how he's responsible for Charles Manson and the family in the 1960s, how he is responsible for just everything under the sun or in the darkness. I couldn't quite follow along too well. I know what I know what he's talking about. His poetry inspired other people, and then also Francis Thompson would make predictions more or less about the future. Maybe not in terms of psychic power, just about insightful statements. But let's look at some challenges to Francis Thompson being a Jack the Ripper suspect. Number one, some people intensely believe to the contrary that Jack the Ripper was not English. They believe that the witness descriptions are talking about someone who had an Eastern European experience, Central or Eastern European, most likely Polish or Russian. As previously stated, not everyone is in agreement that Jack the Ripper was English. They believe that Jack the Ripper was also Jewish. And there's also the Goulston Street Graffito that says the Jews will not be blamed for nothing. This is partnered with the fact that FBI profile made by John Douglas happened years after the Ripper case, and it happened a century after the Ripper case when that profile was created. But looking back at other in other places, suspects such as Aaron Kosminski or maybe even David Cohen could actually be viewed as a little bit more favorable compared to someone such as Francis Thompson. Also, everything that I have shared in this episode about him as a Ripper suspect is circumstantial. Okay, the guy went to medical school and it didn't work out. Okay, the guy was addicted to opium. Okay, the guy wrote poetry that has some type of bizarre imagery relating to women. And yes, in his other poems, he does also talk about blood and spilling, blood spilling and such. Just because somebody is an underperformer who has a very wild imagination does not mean that he committed this specific murder spree. But I'm going to be very honest with you guys. I think that Francis Thompson is a suspect that should be higher on the list compared to some of the other people that I've talked about. And there are even wilder suspects out there, such as Thomas Neal Cream. He should practically be eliminated. He was in jail in America, most likely, at the time in 1888, and didn't get out of jail until 1891, so says me anyway. Then you have a suspect like Charles Lechmere, whom... whom... Richard Patterson speaks very highly of, actually. When he talks about the research of Christopher Holmgren, he speaks very highly of and said after his suspect, Francis Thompson, he thinks that Charles Lechmere could have been Jack the Ripper. That would be his number two suspect. And I have this back-and-forth um, understanding of the Lechmere case because Patterson, by his own admission, also provided a very solid explanation about how these types of theories are functioning. Charles Lechmere was the first witness on the scene after the murder of Polly Nichols, August 31st, 1888, and 
he was the first person there. Just because somebody found the body does not mean that they were the killer. Just because somebody is in the vicinity of the crime scene walking by, because the logic that was provided by Patterson, somebody has to find the body. And the same thing is true if you're going to look at other suspects such as Louis Deemschutz, who is the suspect of Randy Williams in the book uh, Sherlock Holmes and the Autumn of Terror, talking about how he is in the vicinity of the crime scene of Long Liz Stride, the third victim. Okay, just because somebody is in the vicinity of the crime scene, it does not mean that they were the killer, because somebody had to find the body. Eventually, somebody would be walking by, and they would have been the first person there. And as I said, I have a back and forth understanding of the of Charles Lechmere and Louis Deemschutz as suspects. To the credit of Randy Williams, I thought I was going to go into his material thinking that that is the most ridiculous theory that I have ever possibly heard. I mean, for the reasons that Patterson had stated, just because he's riding a horse and cart nearby doesn't mean he was the killer, that he was the orchestrator and architect of the entire Ripper crime spree. But Randy Williams defends his case pretty well, actually, and he has some good observations. And the same is true of the people who are proposing Charles Lechmere as a suspect because he had access to these crime scenes. The challenge is, what did he do with the murder weapon, and how did he fool everyone to think that there was no blood on his clothes. Did, was he wearing some type of other bloody cloak that he would have stashed, and no one noticed all the fresh blood that would have been on his body? So that is just a big problem with the Lechmere theory, and I have to give credit to Jay for making that observation, but it is one that I do agree with at present. Now, with somebody like Francis Thompson, I also have to concede that even though I said I thought that his, the narrative created by Richard Patterson was rather well done— a lot of it is just mental organization, composing an explanation, and I get very skeptical when certain true crime writers are saying, okay, well, this guy would have been doing this, and actually, he wouldn't have said yes to that. No, he would have said no to that, or he would have been thinking like this. He wouldn't have been thinking like that. I think that in their own confidence, they overlook the fact that they don't have the ability to actually read this person's mind. They've been researching this person for years. They know more about this person than any other living individual on the face of the earth. That doesn't necessarily mean that they have completely mastered their thought process. And in, in, in doing so, there could be vital errors that have been made. But that's just my take on the subject. What do you think about Francis Thompson as a Jack the Ripper suspect? What do you think about the points put forward that he lived in the area, he was someone who was in his late 20s, he had medical knowledge, surgical knowledge, was reported to regularly carry a large scalpel or a knife with him, he wrote morbid poetry, or sometimes poetry that dealt with bizarre imagery. He was a very intelligent intelligent individual, gifted underperformer, addicted to opium, had an animosity toward women. What do you think about those points? And what do you think about the counterpoints that I've shared in this episode? Anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box. And there was always blackboxnade88 over on Instagram. And I will see you there for the bonus podcast. Until next time.